Welcome to this tutorial session. Thank you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> Mr. Jam. Yes, please. Hey, how you doing? We're gonna have fun in the I know, right? Um, all right, listen up. This is how we will roll today. We will start with the free response, and then we are going to move forward to the multiple choice section. Now the exam will consist of 30 multiple choice questions and uh, one free response questions. In the course of the review, if you have any questions, please ask. It will defeat the purpose if you're here and you still go out without questions. There are a couple of you that have valid excuses and uh, this is totally optional too. You're, you're, you're you're welcome to leave anytime you feel as to, but please use the back door and uh, try not to disrupt the class, okay? Let's get rolling. The first question is quite interesting. A block of mass M is held motionless on a rough inclined plane by means of a string attached to a vertical wall as shown in the diagram. You know that the very first question that they will always ask you is for you to draw a free body diagram. Now, to, for you to draw a free body diagram, you need to look at the object, which is the block, and ask yourself, what is it interacting with? In this case, it's interacting with the string, with the inclined surface, as well as with the earth. So if we do the free body diagram, this is the first diagram that I'm drawing. It will help us to draw the free body diagram. This angle here is theta. We have the weight mg acting vertically downwards. You have the tension in the string T. There is friction. So since it's at rest, definitely it's static friction. And you have the normal force which is perpendicular. Now, I so happen to have looked over a couple of your solutions and you made a couple of mistakes that I want to rectify here. Now, take note of the following. Gravity, weight is the gravitational pull of the Earth on any object on Earth. And it always acts vertically downward. It doesn't matter the surface in which the object is placed the weight is always vertically downwards. Now, the normal force is the contact force that a surface exerts on another surface pressed on it. Now, what you need to take note is that the contact force is always perpendicular to what? The surface. The reason I'm stressing this is because some people drew the normal force pointing vertically upwards. It will only be vertically upward only if the surface is what? Flat and horizontal. Weight always points vertically downward in all free body diagrams. The normal force is always perpendicular to the surface on which it is acting. Comprende? Okay, great. Now, we, can, we are now ready for our free body diagram. How do you know which way friction goes? Very intelligent question. Very good question. Now, static friction, listen, it is easy for you to know the direction of kinetic friction. But the direction of static friction, sometimes it's daunting to know. But how do you know? Kinetic friction will always act in the opposite direction of what? Motion. Which means that if the object is sliding down the inclined plane, then kinetic friction will point upwards. But if the object is sliding up the inclined plane, kinetic friction will act along the plane and downwards. You understand that, right? Mm -hmm. But static friction, ask yourself, in this position, if everything was loose, in what direction will the block move? Down. down. So static friction will act up. So the direction of static friction always points in the direction in which, in the opposite direction in which the object has a tendency to do what? Right, to move if everything was loose. You understand that, right? Which means that if you have an object 
at rest on a flat surface, what is the static friction? Zero. Because it has no, there is no tendency for the object to do what? Move. Unless an external force is applied on it, right? If I now apply an external force on it, then my static friction will be in the opposite direction to what? The external force, okay? Now, um, let's roll. So if we draw our free body diagram, now you have here, this is M. This will be our static friction. This will be tension T. That is the normal force N. And uh, I think we are done with the free body diagram. One thing I want to caution you guys is do not draw do not draw or, or, or resolve forces on your free body diagram. Um, so let us go back up here and resolve our forces. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. Always, though you will not earn points for doing so, the greater of your scripts will help him to know exactly what directions you've chosen. All right? It will, go ahead, please. Yes, that's like you're resolving on a free body diagram. I would recommend that you should not do that. Not because, because for the past 10 or so years, every question given by the college board, they always caution students not to resolve for, um, their forces on the free body diagram. Now, that is bad for the student, but good for the college board because it helps the graders easy to grade. But then for the students, you need to, to do what resolve your forces to be able to add your forces right. So in that respect, that's why I am drawing my, I'm resolving my forces here. This is going to be as usual, mg sine theta, and this is going to be mg cosine theta. And this angle here is theta. This is, my x and that is my y vividly looking at this diagram you will realize that that the forces along the y direction balances and the forces along the x direction balances the reason i do recommend that you also tilt your axis to be along the plane is because when you do this you can analyze the system just like you're analyzing a system on a horizontal surface. So in this case, you have, you have, your axis helps you. But if you maintain your axis, for example, like that, you will realize that your coordinate axis itself makes an angle with the plane, and that complicates the problem. It actually becomes more than beyond the scope of AP Physics 1. So um, to so I will recommend you follow my recommendation. So the next question is derive an expression for the normal force on the mass in the inclined plane. Coming back here, you will see that the summation of Fx will be equal to N minus Mg cosine theta. And the summation of Fy will be equal to what? C plus Fs minus Mg sine theta. So if I use that fact, how do you earn points? Look up, this is critical. If this was your test, where will you earn points? This is a point. This is a point. This is a point. This is a point. So just by drawing a free body diagram, you've earned what four points easy points to get so never mess up here do you understand me easy points to get now the next calculate the normal force yes please um you mean here 
You mean you don't understand this? Yeah. All right. Please look up. He may not be alone. Let me explain. You have your weight acting vertically downwards. This is mg. Now understand that this will be your wy and this will be your wx. This angle is theta. This is the hypotenuse, the opposite and the adjacent. If you use your socotoire, the sine of theta is going to be opposite wx divided by the hypotenuse mx which means that Wx will be equal to Mg sine theta. So the component acting along the plane is Mg sine theta. You understand that, right? And if you use the cosine, cosine theta is the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse, which means that Wy is equal to Mg cosine theta. So the component perpendicular to the plane is mg cosine theta. Now, this is how you get it, but subsequently I just do this because we've done this over and over. Now, this is the trick. Before I go, if I'm giving you the same question in the exam, I'm going to trick you because I cannot give you the same problem. And where will I trick you? Instead of saying that this is theta, I will put my theta here. You see that if I do that, listen, I'm releasing some teacher trick now. Listen, if I do that, if I do that automatically, this becomes mg what? Cosine, and this becomes mg sine. And if in the test, and if in the test you instinctively write mg sine, I know that you are memorizing. I automatically dug you a lot of points. So we'll be, uh, <laughs> that's fair. Everything else will be the same though. Yeah, everything else will be the same. <laughs> yes, please. Please, please, please. Uh -huh. Now, if you look at geometry, if this is rather theta, you discover that Cosine theta actually becomes sine theta. Be she means on the mm -hmm. summation of fx, yeah. you put you, on y value. You mean here? Oh, 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 this is, sorry, thank you. This is, this is f of y, and this is f of x. Thank you, that's a very good observation. So please, please, this is the recommendation I'm about to give you. When you see a problem in the test, read in between the lines. Because you can quickly, by instinct, derive an expression for the normal force. You start first by stating Newton's second law, F equal to MA. This gives you one point. This gives you one point. That is the principle you are going to use. But we know that since... But we know that the summation of f in the y direction is zero. This gives you another point. So this means that n minus mg cosine theta is equal to zero. This gives you a point. And therefore, n is equal to mg cosine theta. And uh, this is a point. You see that if you had just written these two, you will lose two points. Even though, even though you knew what you were doing. But I will not assume that. Do you understand this? Now the next. Derive an expression for the tension in the string. Tension is a force acting along the x direction. We know that the summation of fx is equal to zero. You earn a point. Yes, please. Let's take it gradually. Now, which means that t plus fs minus mg sine theta, all of this should be equal to zero. You earn a point here. 
Bert, look up now, fellas. This means this means that T is equal to mg sine theta minus fs. You don't earn a point here. But, <laughs> but what is fs? It's just equal to mu s multiplied by n. You earn a point here. Which is going to be equal to mu s mg cosine theta. You earn a point there. You see how generous this can be? Therefore, T will be equal to mg sine theta minus mu s mg cosine theta. This is the expression we are looking for for T. You then earn a point. Look up, please. D was, it asks you to derive an expression for the coefficient of static friction there. This is the expression for mu. So, technically, you would see that mu s mg cosine theta will be equal to t minus mg sine theta, which means that, yeah, yeah, it will be the opposite. Thank you. Um, this will be mg sine theta minus t. Look up, please. This would mean that mu s will be equal to mg sine theta minus t all divided by mg cosine theta. Is that it? That's it. And, and here, this is one point. One point. The second is, listen, listen please. When, when the string is cut, just after the string is cut, the system is still at rest. At that point, t will be equal to zero. So we would have mg sine theta equal to mu s mg cosine theta, in which case mu s will be equal to sine over cosine, which is just going to be what? Tan theta. Remember that when the string is just cut, just after the string is cut, the system is still in equilibrium. And this gives you the actual value of mu for that inclined plane. You understand that, right? Now, let me do this. I'm going to, for the sake of your test, please review this. This is a table. And that table is standing at a certain height above the ground. And you have a ram like that at a certain angle, theta. I'm not going to do this problem. This height is H. This height is H. You have a block released from rest of mass M at the top of the ram. Here, V is zero. Listen now, the block slides down the ramp and shoots off as a projectile motion and travels a certain distance R. Remember that this height is H. So I could ask you a lot of questions in this simple problem. We've done all of this in class. The first thing I want you to do is to draw a free body diagram of this object on the ramp. We've done that. The next thing is for you to calculate the acceleration of this object down the ramp. And we've done that. And we know that it's A will be equal to G sine theta. The most interesting question then is to ask you to calculate the velocity at the bottom of the ramp, which we have done that in class. And we've actually drawn the graphs. You need to be able to be to be able to calculate the velocity of the block at the bottom of the ram, which will be the initial horizontal speed. Now the killer question is for you to calculate R, 
the horizontal distance traveled by the block when it hits the ground. And for you to do that, you need to calculate the time of flight. And you can calculate that we did that in class T is the square root of 2h over what? G. You need to be able to calculate the velocity of the block just before it hits the ground. And we did that in class. Then you need to be able to calculate the horizontal range. Well, that being said, let's go back to the multiple choice section. The next question is, suppose the string breaks and the block slides down the inclined plane as shown, derive an expression for the acceleration of the block. We know that Newton's second law states that the summation of F will be equal to what MA. This gives you a point. The forces along the inclined plane would be MG sine theta minus FS minus T. All of this should be equal to MA. This gives you a point. When the string breaks, the tension becomes zero. This gives you a point. That's why I'm so saying. X, it, so you can't like. If you do that, you will lose points along the way. That's why I do recommend. Listen, please. Listen. It's easy for you. Listen. When I say this, so we have here. We also know that F S is. Okay. Look up, everybody. Look up. And a mistake that students will make, which I've made unconsciously, to be honest, is to write Fs. When the, when the string breaks and it starts sliding down the plane, the friction becomes what? Kinetic. Kinetic. So mu k, Fk is equal to mu k n, which is just going to be mu k mg cosine theta. This earns you two points one point here and one point here Wait, so can you explain that step a little bit remember friction is defined as mu n it doesn't matter what kind of friction if it's kinetic fk will be equal to mu k if it's static fs is going to be equal to what mu s n you understand that right so now since it's kinetic we are going to use this guy and fortunately for us, the normal force doesn't change. So it's still mg cosine theta. Now, this would mean that mg sine theta minus mu k mg cosine theta is equal to ma. If we now the M's can cancel as you since it's common and the acceleration A. This will earn you a point. The acceleration A will be given by G sine theta minus mu k G cosine theta. And that is what I expected from you. And this will give you a point. You see how generous this is? You earn more... <coughs> Yes, please. Is this practice exam a homework grade or an extra grade? Homework grade. Yes, please. Yeah. The free response will not be the problem. The problem will be the multiple choice section. Do you know why? What I'm saying is this. In the physics test, in the AP exam and in my class exam, the problem will not be the free response. It will always be the multiple choice. Because it will look as if you really know the stuff. You understand that, right? If you look at the way this practice exam is like, you seem like you know it, but when you dig deep into it, you seem like you don't know it. It's because the test is designed to test your conceptual understanding. And therefore, in class, my advice is, when you are listening to my lectures and participating in class, pay attention to the things I tell you to pay attention. And make sure 
you write things down. Every little bit of everything counts. Every little bit of everything counts. And if you, for example, attend these tutorial sessions up until May, you will gather a lot of tricks along the way that will help you. In class, I'm concerned with your learning. I want you to understand. So I don't give you the tricks. In the tutorial, I don't care about your learning. I want you to succeed in the test. So I give you the tricks. Do you understand the difference? Yes. So that's why the two are important. Yes, please. Yes. Number one, a student, a student attached two fans on a 0 0.7 kilogram card that is resting on a card track. The fans are pointed in opposite directions. The fans can run at variable speeds. Let me say this is A and this is towards B. If we turn off fan 2 and put on fan 1, in what direction will this thing move, towards A or towards B? Let me ask again. If you turn on fan B, if we turn on off fan 2 and leave fan 1 on, it will move towards A. If we turn off fan 1 and leave 2 on, it will move towards B. That is settled. Okay. The fans can run at different speeds. The student turn on fan 1 at high speed and fan 2 at low speeds. F G represents the gravitational force. This is the gravitational force. F N represents the normal force. This is F N. F1 and F2 are the external forces due to fan 1. So F1 is the force due to fan 1, which will act that way. And F2 is the force due to fan 2, which will act that way. Remember that fan 1 is running at a high speed, and fan 2 is running at what? A low speed, which means that F1 is greater than what? F2. So in what direction will the card move? Towards A. That is settled. So let's answer the question. So which of these free body diagrams represent the scenario? It will be C. How many got it right? Let me see. Great, everybody. Now the next. Number two, a glider is placed on an air track. Whenever you hear air track, it means that there is what? No friction. no friction. Which is set at an angle of one degree with the horizontal. Now it is noted that the air, before the air is turned on, the, the glider does not accelerate down the track but remains at rest. This happens before the air is turned on. Which of the following best explains this observation? The glider exerts a friction force on the track directly up the track. What this means is we have a track at a certain angle theta and we have a glider. Before, listen, before the air is turned on, the glider is at rest. The weight acting mg, there is a component of the weight along the track. If the glider is at rest, it means this can only be possible if there is a force that is opposing what? mg sine theta. And that force is what? Static friction. And the question I want to ask is this. This force, the static friction, is it acting on the glider or on the surface of the track? And if it's acting on the glider, it means that it is the surface exerting the force on what? The glider. Do you understand that? All right, now we have A. The glider exerts a friction force on the track directly upwards. Is that true? 
That is not true. The track asserts a friction force on the glider directed up the track. That is true. The component of the normal force on the glider, that is not true. And uh, that is not true. So the answer here is what? B. Yes, please. Okay, look up this way. The normal force is perpendicular to the track. So the normal force do not have a component of the track. Listen, the normal force is perpendicular to the track. So the normal force do not have a component of the track. Do you get that? Okay, great. Now question three. Please, a monkey hangs by his two hands on a vine. We did this problem like that. This is our monkey. Which of the following are examples of appropriate action-reaction pairs pertaining to this situation? Remember, action-reaction F12 is equal to what? F21. This is magnitude. An upward force on the monkey by the vine. A downward force on the vine by the monkey. This looks like a possibility. An upward force on the monkey by the vine. A downward force on the monkey by the earth. This could not be a possibility. Why? The upward force on the monkey by the vine is tension. The downward force on the monkey by the earth is gravity. The two forces must be of what? The same kind. An upward force on earth by the monkey. A downward force on the vine by the monkey. This could not be an upward force on earth by monkey. A downward force on the monkey by the earth. Yes. No. Yes. An upward force. Remember, remember, please look up. Look up. Action reaction pairs never act on the same body. An upward force on earth by monkey. A downward force on monkey by earth. They're acting on two different bodies. Look at question one. Even though it's a possibility. An upward force on monkey, a downward force on what? On vine by monkey. So this is correct. And this is correct. So the answer is A. And the answer is what? D. Remember that in, 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 in the multiple choice in the AP, there are multi-select questions with more than one answer. So the answer is A and D. Now the next question, this is an interesting one. We have a car which is on a surface and we have little Johnny inside the car. A system consists of three objects, a car, a person seated in the car and the earth. How many action-reaction pairs can you identify involving these three? Now understand this. This is a terminology issue. In the AP, you can hear action-reaction pairs or interaction pairs. They mean the same thing. Yes, please. Is the car moving? The question hasn't identified if the car is moving. So let's reconsider this. When you are given a problem like this, what is your line of attack? Write down the objects. You have the car, you have the person, and you have what? Earth. Look up, please. You, we, you, this is how you have to arrange this. You will consider the car person. You will consider the person Earth. And you will consider what? Car Earth. Because these are the various pairs that could give rise to interaction, right? When you consider when you consider the person and earth, it gives rise to one interaction pair. When you consider the car and the earth, it gives rise to two interaction pair. Now when you consider the person and car, it gives rise to two interaction pairs. Let me explain. In class, what did I tell you guys? That everybody attracts every other person with a force called what? 
gravity. Listen, and I said to help you remember, and I said that does not explain why we fall in love with each other. And somebody wrote a very nice joke there, the more massive you are, the more attractive you are. <laughs> uh, now, now please, listen, we don't have time, so I'm going to move on. The answer is C. At rest. We're considering the case at rest. Yeah. No. Wait, isn't it? What about the... Please, please. Please, please. If, if the car is moving, if the car is moving, there will be six. Why? Because there will be friction. Why? Because there will be what? Friction. If the car is not moving, there will be five. Because earth person you have one interaction pair, car earth you have two interaction pair, person car you have two interaction what pairs. So should we assume that the car is moving? So we are assuming that the car is at rest. But if you had chosen six, I will still give you what your grades, because that will be for the person who assumed that the car is moving. Look up, please. It's the same kind of problem. A student draws the following diagram to represent Newton's third law action reaction pair on a glass of water sitting on a table. You have the normal force and the force of gravity. You know that this can never be Y. Why can they not form an action-reaction pair? Yes? Um, because they're acting, on the same they're acting on the same body. And secondly, this is a contact word. The question says, which of the following statements offer the best analysis of the student's diagram? Select two. Statement one. The normal force is a reaction force in response to the action force of gravity. What I'm saying is the normal force cannot be a reaction force to the force of gravity. B. The diagram illustrates an action-reaction pair because the forces are of equal magnitude and opposite in direction. What I'm saying is the normal force and, the, and gravity cannot form an action-reaction pair. C. The diagram illustrates external forces on the glass and not an action-reaction pair. This statement is true. Force diagrams for Newton's third law must illustrate two interacting objects and one type of force. This statement is true. So the answer is C and D. You and your lab partner are seated in a stationary passenger train at a train station. The train engine begins to pull the train from rest down the track, accelerating it at about one meters per square second. Your friend remarks that until the train reaches a constant velocity, Newton's third law does not apply. Is this true or false? False. false. Since the forward force of the engine exerts, exerts on the passenger car must necessarily be larger than the backward force than the passenger car exerts on the engine, which of the following statements most correctly addresses your lab partner's statement? A. Your lab partner is correct. We know that's not true. B, your lab partner is correct. That's not true. C, your lab partner is incorrect. That is true. Now, the reason a corollary to Newton's third law provides 
for different force magnitudes no the same force magnitude so this is not true and d your lab partner is incorrect the acceleration is due to other forces which is perfectly right correct one thing i must remark i know that some of you will be leaving in four minutes so seven i love this question a bird a bird is standing in a closed box that is resting on a scale. The bird jumps into the air and begins flying around the box, staying at a constant height. Assume that the scale can adjust instantaneously to any change in the applied force. While the bird is in the air inside the box, does the scale A increase its reading? B decrease its reading. C give the same reading as the bird is standing on the floor. D not enough information. It's like you have a scale and you have a close box and our little bird is flying around. Inside the close box. Let me ask you a question. The box is closed. This is important. Meaning that it is airtight. If it is airtight, when the bird... Now, what I'm saying is, the box is airtight. So, even when the bird is flying around in the box, the content of the box is the same. So, the weight of the box remains the same. Therefore, the scale reading remains the same. Then, you have your bird... The bird is actually not interacting with the scale. The box is. So even when the bird flies off, what happened? The box is still interacting with the scale and the weight has not changed. Yes, please. But when the bird is standing on the floor of the box, doesn't it add its weight to the weight? The weight still remains the same. When you still jump up, it's in the box. The weight of the box really hasn't changed. Do you know why? Because when the bird leaps up, it displaces air molecules, so the content of the box still remains the same. So the weight of the box doesn't change. Now, a box M is sitting at rest on an inclined plane at an angle theta as shown above. Which of the following is true? A. Gravity and the normal force from the surface can keep the block stationary. Is that true? No. The best way for you to answer this is to start by drawing what? Your free body diagram. An additional force which must point up along the inclined plane is needed. That is true. Why? Because the component of the weight acting downwards, mg sine theta, will pull the block downwards. For the block to remain at rest, there must be an additional force pointing upwards along the plane, and this will be static friction, not kinetic. So, um, this will be true. An additional force, this is not true. And uh, this is not true, so the answer is B. Number 10. Oh. Oh. Number 10 is a little bit, look up please. It says that these three forces with exactly identical magnitudes cannot add up to zero because if you look at it carefully here, you will see that along the x direction, F cosine theta will be equal to F cosine theta. So the only problem that it cannot add up to zero will be along what? The y direction. <laughs> Automatically, you see that this, you take it out. This, you take it out. This, you take it out. Without even thinking, the answer is already A. So I think the y components cannot add up to zero and the answer is A. Uh, that's why you're here, Sarah. Let's look at 11. These kind of questions are really important. 
these two forces can add up to zero under what conditions? Now, without even looking at the answer choices, let us analyze the system. This angle here is alpha, which means that we can resolve this force into two components. This will be what? F2 cosine alpha, and this will be F2 sine alpha. Which means that for the two forces to add up to what? Zero. What must be alpha? There must be a force. Listen, for these two forces to add up to zero, there must be a force in this direction. And that could not be because this guy is perpendicular. And therefore, theta must be what? 180. 180. So A, only the right values, this is not true. Only the right values for the angle theta, this is a possibility. Only the, no, only the right values for the magnitudes and the angle, no. We need more information. So the only reason it can be true is for theta to be what? 180 degrees. And therefore, the answer should be what? B. So we are dealing with only the right value for what? Theta. Yes, please? Wait, do we assume F1 equals to F2? No. So now, wait a minute. So yeah, sure. Right? Sure, the answer is C. Yes, the answer is C. Thank you, fellas. Now look up, please. That's why I love this class. Um, Which class? Pardon? Number 12, you are a passenger. Yeah, I debated this today. Um, and this is quite interesting, and I learned a lot from it. You are a passenger in a car and not wearing a seat belt, which is a bad idea. Without changing its speed, the car suddenly takes a sharp left. And you find yourself colliding with the right door. <laughs> Question A. Before and after your collision with the door, there is a rightward force pushing you towards the door. This is not true. Why? Before collision, there is no force pushing you to the right. Your inertia is taking you to the right. Do you understand that? After collision, there is no force pushing you to the right. Your inertia is taking you to the right. B, before collision with the door, there is a rightward force on you. That is not true. Before collision, there is no rightward force on you. Your inertia is causing you to move to the right, which is Newton's word, third law of motion. C, Starting at the time of your collision, the door exerts a leftward force on you. Yes. Yeah. This is true. Newton's third law of what? Motion. So the answer is C. 13. You are standing in an elevator. Yes, please. A question? It's okay. Me too. I do that. <laughs> I do that all the time. You are standing in an elevator which is not moving. You feel the elevator pushing up on you on your feet with a force of mg. Correct? When the elevator accelerates upwards, the floor still pushes up on you with a force mg and you push down on the floor with the same force. This is not true. Do you know why? This is the normal force on you. This is your weight, mg. When you accelerate upwards, you have n minus mg equal to ma, which means that the force that the floor pushes up on you, n, will be equal to mg plus ma. It increases. In this case, you feel as if you weigh more or you feel the, a sharp increase in the force below your feet. So A could not be true. B, you still push down on the floor. 
with a force mg, but to accelerate you upward, the flow pushes up on you with a force larger than mg. This is true. The flow pushes up on you with a force that is not true. That is not true. That is not true. So the answer is B. There will be a question similar to this in the test. 14. There may, there may or may not be friction between the block and the table. Now assume that the block moves to the right at constant velocity. Which of the following is true? Only one answer is correct. Now understand that when an object moves with a constant velocity, the acceleration is what? Zero. According to Newton's first law, a zero acceleration would mean that the net force acting on the object is what? Zero. What this statement is saying is the forces on the object are what? Balanced. There is a force acting forward. For it to move with a constant speed, there must be a countering force acting backward. So this is not true. This is impossible without friction. That is true. This is impossible without friction. This is not true. So the answer is between A and C. It might be possible if friction is between the block and the table. It definitely would be possible if friction, if there is friction between the block and the table. Yes, it might be possible. Might and definitely. What is the difference between these two words? If there is friction and the force is still greater than, it will not be possible because it will accelerate. But if there is friction and the forces are what equal, then it will be what? Traveling with a constant speed. So the answer is B. So this is more like a language test. <laughs> and I, I know, right? The same thing. Now, look up, everybody. The block accelerates to the right. It accelerates to the right. And the block can only accelerate to the right if there is a net force acting to the right. Newton's second law. Now, there may or may not be friction. If the block accelerates to the right, which of the following statements is true? This is impossible. This is this is possible without any friction. True. Thank you. You're welcome, Kiana. Now A is a possibility. Thank you, Bruno. Um, <coughs> B. This is impossible without friction. That is not true. C. This is impossible without friction. This is not true. The answer definitely is A. Um, the next question, my goodness, there are many more of this. You know there is friction between the block and the table, okay? Assume that the block moves down the inclined plane. If the block moves down the inclined plane, in what direction is friction? Up. Up. And what kind of friction? Kinetic. The friction force is zero, not true. The friction force obviously points in the direction L. Not true. The friction fields obviously point in the direction R. That is true. Why is it obviously? So sassy. Just words, my friend. I know, right? <laughs> you are throwing a ball straight up in the air at the highest point. What do we know happens at the highest point? V is zero. Is the acceleration zero? It's equal to? Negative G. If the acceleration is not zero, is the force at the highest point zero? Is the force at the highest point zero? No. It's equal to negative mg. A, acceleration and velocity are both zero, not true. Velocity is non-zero, not true. Acceleration, non-zero, true. So the answer is C. Number 17, sorry, 18. 18 is a little technical. Four identical blocks are moving on a surface for which the coefficient of kinetic friction is the same 
between each block and the surface and its mu k. The velocity of each block is indicated by the vector on the block. For which block is the force of friction between the block greatest? What is the answer here? Remember that the, the friction does not, let me write it out, depend on one. Who can name the factors? Yes? Surface area. Surface area. Great. And the velocity. So what would be the answer? They are the same. Great, great. They are the same. I love that. The next, I love this question. A heavy truck and a light car are traveling at the same speed on the same highway. If the coefficient of friction between their tires and the road are the same, which car will stop in the shortest distance? Which car will stop in the shortest distance? Remember, I intentionally put this here for a reason. Friction does not depend on surface area. It does not depend on what? Velocity. But friction depends on what? The normal force, which in turn depends on what? The weight. The more weight you have, the more friction. Uh, thank you, please. Come on, give me a fist. Great. This is really helpful. Look up, please. Look up. Look up. Look up. Um, we have here the weight mg. We have the friction force fk. We can resolve t into two components. This is t sine theta, and this is t cosine theta. We have the normal force acting upwards. Um, the system is on a rough surface. Great. We need to calculate the friction force. Looking at the sum of forces in the y direction, we will have T sine theta plus N minus mg. All of this should be zero. This would mean that N is equal to mg minus T sine theta. This is the normal force. But we know that friction is defined as what? Mu K N, which will just be mu k mg minus t sine theta so the answer here is what now this is a tricky one we have an object on an incline a horizontal force is used to push an object up an incline the force is horizontal this is f Please pay attention to this one, it's tricky. We have the weight acting vertically downwards as usual. <coughs> this is mg. We can resolve this. This will be mg cosine theta. This will be mg sine theta. You have the normal force. Up. Is, there, is the inclined plane rough? Um, doesn't it doesn't say. So let's assume it's smooth. Understand that this angle here is theta, which is equal to this angle here. There are corresponding angles, if you can see that. It's, you, you see that, right? Which means we can resolve this will be F cosine theta, and this will be F sine theta. So if you want to sum the forces in the y direction, you're going to have N minus F sine theta minus mg all equal to zero. This means that N will be equal to F sine theta plus mg. F sine theta plus mg. Um, are we? Wait, why not no, we are missing something. Wait, why is it it's mg cosine theta. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. It's going to be n minus f 
sine theta minus mg cosine theta equal to zero, which means that n is equal to f sine theta plus mg cosine theta. This is the value for n, and our answer should be c. c. My goodness, I love this this practice test. It really, it's really mind-boggling. Pardon? It really eliminates who can stand it. Yep, exactly, Sarah. <laughs> now, um, <clears throat> 22. This guy is having a lot of fun. He's at rest. So the weight is vertically <laughs> downwards. The normal force is and the friction will be yeah there's friction he cannot be at rest if there is no friction you know that right you know why do you know why because if he is sitting on an inclined plane then there will be a component of the weight along the plane downwards and he can only be at rest if there is a force countering that component so which one is the correct answer that should be E. We are almost there, fellas. Now, the, di the, the diagram, the block show shown in the figure have two equal masses and are made of the same material. The velocity is the same in each figure. The total frictional force exerted by the surface on each block is I love this question it's D uh, wait C and B yeah yeah it's D I like your confidence now 24 a constant force is asserted for a short time interval on a cart that is initially at rest on an air track. The force gives the cart a certain final velocity. Suppose we repeat the experiment, but instead of starting from rest, the cart is already moving with a constant speed in the direction of the force at the moment we begin to apply the force. After we assert the same constant force for the same short time interval, the increase in the cart's speed, e, the, the increase in the cart speed, let me see the choices, is equal to two times its initial speed, is equal to the square of the initial speed, is the same as when it is started from rest. The reason is simply because an object at rest and an object moving with a constant word, speed are equivalent. This is a consequence of whose laws of motion? Second. First law. Wait, what? Oh, yeah, yeah. I thought you were talking about first, first law. Now, the next, you drop a book from a certain height. Listen, fellas. You drop a book from a certain height. It falls because of the gravitational force exerted by the earth on it because these forces always because forces always come in interaction pairs the book must exert a force on the earth how does the magnitude of f by book on earth compare to the magnitude of f by earth on book they should be equal so the answer is c and this is newton's third law of what motion 26. An object is moving due south with a constant velocity. Then, a net force directed due west acts on the object for a short period of time, after which the net force is zero newtons. Which of the following is correct? The final velocity of the object will be directed due 
south. Remember, in accordance with Newton's second law, the direction of acceleration will always be in the same direction as what? The velocity. Now, if an object is moving due south and an object acts due north, what happens is that it changes the direction of what? Motion. It doesn't change the magnitude. It only changes what? The direction. So, what would be the answer here? The final velocity of the object will be directed due south of west. Let's draw the compact direction. Is this, this is the north, right? North, south, east, west. Am I correct? No, no, it's the other way around. It's west, east. Okay, great. North, south, west, east. To be honest, sometimes I get confused on this compact thing. Uh, so, the car is moving the car is moving due south when it's when a net force acts on it due west yeah due west so the particle will end up moving south of west so the answer is a In a moving elevator, a woman standing on a bathroom scale notices that the reading on the scale is significantly larger. <laughs> you know the bathroom scale, you could take it anywhere, right? Let me read it again, please. Before I do, Understand this, when you, when you are standing at rest in an elevator, you are the force or the value registered by, your, by the bathroom scale is your actual weight. When you are accelerating upwards, it increases. When you are accelerating downwards, it decreases. So... Looking at the reading of the SWAT scale, you can determine whether is it speeding upwards or is it speeding downwards. Or if it's moving upwards or downwards at a constant speed. Remember, standing at rest is equivalent to moving upward or downward with what? A constant speed. So let's continue reading. The elevator itself has only two forces acting on it. The tension in the cable and the force of gravity. Which one of the following statements is false concerning this situation? The elevator is accelerating uniformly. That is true, but they haven't mentioned the direction. It could be accelerating upward, which will be true. But if it's accelerating downward, it will not be true. So that was a trick one. B, the speed is increasing as it moves upwards. That is true. It's accelerating upward, meaning that the, the magnitude of the velocity is increasing upwards. Are we to find the force? Yes. Uh, so, the statement is true. The tension exceeds the weight. This is true. The elevator could be moving upward at constant speed. No. This is false. Wait, what, is it, wait, wait, what does C mean? Because if it's moving upward at constant speed, it means that the normal force is equal to the weight. But remember that the scale register is significantly larger than the elevator at rest. Okay, so isn't A true then? Because it can be... A, it can be... It's true, but depending upon how... If it's accelerating downwards... If you, let's look at the situation when it's accelerating. If it's accelerating downwards, we have mg um, n 
minus mg equal to minus ma, which means that n will be equal to what? mg minus ma. You realize that instead, the scale will read a lower value. But if it is decelerating downwards, this will be what? Positive, and this will be positive, will read a larger value. You understand that, right? A is half true. A is half true, so it's false. Was the one answer? Yeah. But like, if it was a normal, like, if this was a like, question on the AP exam, would you be able to do that? Yeah. In the AP exam, one third of the questions are multi-select, meaning that you can select more than one answer. Wait, but for A, like, since it doesn't specify whether mm -hmm. it's like accelerating down or upwards, technically that statement would be true. Yeah, technically it would be true, but when you look deep down into it, it is not true in all cases. It's just like saying that when the acceleration of an object is zero, the object is at rest. Technically, that's true just in some instances, but not always true. But like for this question, if D can't be correct because then the acceleration would be zero, that means the object has to have acceleration, and A just states that the object has acceleration. Um... D cannot be correct because if it's moving with a constant speed, it will not register a significantly larger value. So, wait, are you saying for this answer, the correct answer is A and D? Yeah. Choose the statement that is false. One is false. But D is more false than A. This is false. So, D is the it's D not, is it's, false. It doesn't matter. If I drop, if I add a drop of dirty water in this thing, it will be dirty. If I put a bucket of dirty water in this thing, it's dirty. <laughs> yeah. Wait, but this one just says which one, like choose one. Yeah. Honestly, in the answer key, in the answer key, the answer was D, but looking at it, it's, this is not phrased correctly. A force of magnitude F pushes a box of mass 2M which in turn pushes a box of mass M. We did this in class, right? What is the magnitude of the force that a smaller box exerts on a larger box? We know that F21 is equal to MA and we know that A is equal to what? So F over 3M, which means that F21 is equal to M bracket F divided by 3M, which is F divided by 3. So the answer is C. We did this in class anyway.